Oof. How are you all tonight? Good. Uh, we are so glad that you're out with us tonight and uh, here to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're glad to have you, and uh, we extend a welcome to each one of you. Let's start with a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessing on our time together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. You've given us another opportunity to uh, gather together as God's people in this place, to worship you as a body of Christ in this community. We thank you, Lord, that you have established this church. You've established us in this place, in this community. And Lord, you have given us this mandate to reach the world from this place. We ask, Lord, that uh, you would move upon the hearts of those who are here tonight, that we would glimpse your glory, and that, Lord, we would also uh, recognize the privilege, the obligation that you placed upon us and upon our lives to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ and that, Heavenly Father, that you would move in power amongst us. Lord, we pray that you would convict us of sin, that we might repent. And, Heavenly Father, if, we, if there's any here that doesn't know Christ, we ask that you would draw that one to salvation and that you would be glorified in everything that is done. In Jesus' name, amen. Good to be back this evening, and I ask you to stand with us as we sing our first hymn, number one of my favorites, number 33, To God Be the Glory. We'll sing all three verses. one time. Jonathan, if you keep that up. Great things he hath taught us, great things he has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. Especially this part. Pay attention and think about your response on that day. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our victory, when Jesus we see. 
Can you imagine what you'll do when you see Jesus? You know, I don't think we'll all do the same thing. Some people are just born shouters. Some people are born criers. Some people are just born, you know, faller downers, whatever you want to call it. I don't know what we'll all do. But I know what our innermost being does as an act of worship and praise. I believe that's what we'll do. And uh, so I just think that verse, you know, but purer and higher and greater will be than anything we've ever done before. Our wonder, our victory when Jesus we finally see. So we don't walk by faith anymore. It'll be by sight at that moment. Let's sing the chorus together uh, without any music as we sing it one more time going into our fellowship time. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory. Great things He hath done. Amen. Greet your neighbor in the name of the Lord this evening. Number 325, Footsteps of Jesus. This will be our offertory hymn. And in the bulletin it said all, but we'll only sing the first, second, and last if you're following along in your hymn book.
for our church. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for uh, Brother Allen. We ask that you be with Brother Doug. Give them traveling mercies on their trip. As we come to this time in the service, Father, we just ask that you bless the gift and the giver, that all things that are said, done, spent, are all done to your glory, Father. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to have some congregational favorites. So uh, I'm going to ask you to do something maybe some of you have not done in a while. Pick up a hymn book, and if you have a favorite in there that you really like to sing, and maybe we just sang it last week, maybe we hadn't sang it in a long time, uh, as long as we all know it up here, and probably between the three of us, one of us at least know it, um, we're going to try to sing at least one verse of several songs maybe that, uh, that some of you haven't heard in a while. So anybody have a favorite up? Warren? Oh, I like it when they give us the number two. Okay, 158. <clears throat> Nothing but the blood. You may remain seated during this time, and we'll sing the first verse of each hymn that we do, okay? <clears throat> what can wash Number 35, How Great Thou Art. We'll do the first verse as well. back here. I'll get to you next. 255. Sweet, sweet spirit.
448, the second verse. We can do that. Absolutely. Okay, we can do this one, no problem. <clears throat> get this out. 409. When we walk with the Lord. When we walk with this one. Oh, come all you faithful. Thank you for your participation, and uh, maybe we'll do this again sometime. You never know uh, when you do something like this if uh, one person's going to say anything or if 20 people are going to say anything. So uh, uh, great participation, great singing tonight.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Allen. I enjoyed that. That was, that was a lot of fun. And I want to know, how many of you, when you sing to God be the glory, like me, sing, but purer and higher, um, our wonder, our transport, instead of our victory? Yeah. Say, just like Paul and Silas sang it, right? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> uh, that's how you can tell you're getting old. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, turn with me tonight to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, we're continuing through this wonderful epistle of Peter. And tonight I want to talk to you about a subject, uh, a, a lost art, something that uh, I, I would gather that most of you probably have never heard a sermon on tonight. 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 9 tonight. 1 Peter 4, we're going to look at verse 9, just one verse. The apostle is talking about love, love for one another. He says, love will cover a multitude of sins. And then in verse 9, he says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy and the gifts that you have given each one of us, including the gift of Christian hospitality. We ask, Lord, that you would just move upon our hearts, open our hearts and minds to hear and to respond and receive your word tonight with gladness. In Jesus' name, amen. There was a story about a little boy. <clears throat> he was six years old, and he was, uh, he was at home with his parents, and his parents had invited the preacher home for lunch that day after church. And mom and dad were in the kitchen, and they were preparing the meal, and the preacher looked at the little boy, and he said, really smells good. I wonder what we're having for lunch. And the little boy said, we're having goat. And the preacher said, I don't think so. That, that, that doesn't sound right. And the little boy said, I, I know it's goat. My daddy told my mama this, this morning, said, we're having the old goat for lunch. So, <laughs> <clears throat> Hospitality is, is a lost art in our day and time. Uh, we have gotten to the point in our society where we like our privacy. Uh, we like it to be us for and no more. Uh, we live in gated communities cut off from our neighbors. Many of us don't even know who our neighbors are. Uh, we, we just have lost this art of hospitality. And then I want to speak on this subject of hospitality because it is a gift. One of the giftednesses, one of the gifted, uh, gifts that is given to the church is the gift of hospitality, the, the desire to be hospitable to one another. And it is a means by which the church grows, by, by which people are edified, by which we are bound together as the body of Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, whom uh, I differ with in much of his theology, but Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a man back during World War II who uh, was known for rescuing many Jews from the Nazis. Uh, he, was a, he was a Christian pastor. And one of the things that, although I differ with him on much of his theology, one of the things that he had absolutely right was his view of the life of Christians together and fellowship and how we are to love one another and live the Christian life together as the body of Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, you cannot live the Christian life by yourself. You cannot be a Christian by yourself. And in fact, he said that there are a number of Christian disciplines that we like to talk about. We like to talk about the Christian discipline of prayer. We like to talk about the Christian discipline of Bible study, the Christian discipline of assembling ourselves together to worship corporately. But he said there is a Christian discipline that we quite often neglect, and that is the Christian discipline of eating together and enjoying fellowship and extending ho uh, hospitality to one another. It is a Christian discipline. And it is an emphasis of the New Testament. It's an emphasis throughout the Scriptures that we just have neglected, especially as 21st century Christians. And so tonight I want to talk to you on this subject that the Bible addresses regarding hospitality. So what is hospitality? Well, hospitality, first of all, is the ability to welcome people graciously to serve guests and strangers. The Greek word hospitable actually comes from the same root that we find uh, for hospital or hospice. It, it has to do with making people whole, making people feel better, uh, making people, uh, healing people 
from the hurts of the world. We are called to be hospitable to one another. The hospitable person loves to entertain family and friends and strangers as well. The hospitable person enjoys looking after the needs of guests, making sure that they have food and shelter and supplying their physical comforts. The hospitable person doesn't feel imposed on when somebody shows up as an unexpected visitor. The hospitable person has a knack for making strangers feel at ease in their home and also at the church. And that, folks, is why the gift of hospitality is one of the most valuable gifts that we have in the church. It's not one of the most celebrated gifts. It's not one of the upfront gifts, but it is one of the most important gifts in the church. The ability to make strangers and visitors feel welcome, to feel at home. When I pastored in Kentucky. We had a woman, she was in her 90s, and uh, she had been a founding member of the church. And she had one ministry, really only one ministry that she did. She was a greeter in our church. And when people came to our church, inevitably, the first person that you would meet was her. Her name was Marnell. And when she passed away, I remember talking to a number of people and asking them their greatest memory of her. And over and over and over, people, people said, the reason I joined this church was because she was the first person I met when I came here. When I walked through that door, she made me feel welcome. She made me feel like I was at home. We have a Christian responsibility to make everybody who walks through our door feel like we love them. It's related to what we talked about this morning. The fact that we are to reach out and reach a lost and dying world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also we need to make sure that they know, they understand that we love them like Jesus loves them. We care for them like Christ cares for them. And we do that by extending hospitality to people, by loving on them and caring for them. Hospitality includes extending food and shelter and rest and good conversation. It includes providing a place for people to be healed from the pains and the sorrows of this life. Folks, does that sound like what church is supposed to be? To help people heal from the sorrows and pains of this life. We all remember the story of Jesus and his disciples they, uh, when they were staying with Mary and Martha in the scriptures, and Mary is praised because of her attentiveness, sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him teach. But the whole time, Martha is in the back, and she is preparing the food. She's getting things ready. And the, the Bible admonishes Martha because she is so busy trying to, to make sure that there's food for everybody. She's, she's trying to be hospitable. But the thing is, Mary is being more hospitable because... She is sitting and listening. You know, hospitality has to do more with just making someone feel like you care about them than it does with providing their physical needs even. When we just sit down and talk with people and provide conversation and show an interest in them, that is, is the major part of being hospitable. And it doesn't mean that you have the cleanest or nicest or biggest home in the community. If you just be hospitable to people and, and welcome them. Uh, Becky and I had some friends in, in Louisville, and uh, they, were, they were always inviting folks from church to come to their house. Their Sunday school class or the deacons or just, just a group of people, newcomers who would come to church, they would invite them to their house. And Becky and I used to talk about the fact you'd go to their house, and uh, uh, their house was always a wreck. I mean, just honestly. <laughs> Loved them to death, you know, but their, their house was always a wreck. And you, you walk in, and, and a little bit of hoarder, but you walk in, and the thing is, you always felt at home there. You always felt at home. And, and when they invited you, you always wanted to go. Wasn't the nicest house in the city, but it was one of the warmest places to be. That's hospitality. That's hospitality. To just show people that you cared about them. In the ancient world, hospitality was extremely important. For the Greeks, hospitality was a, a sign of being civilized. A civilized person showed hospitality to others. For the Egyptians, hospitality was actually part of what is expected in order to earn a, a better or favorable existence in the next life. 
For the Romans, entertaining strangers was considered a sacred duty. And in biblical culture, extending hospitality was not just a cur courtesy to people, it was a sacred obligation. It was something that God expected you to do. You extended hospitality to a stranger for the Lord's sake. It was part of being obedient to Him. Israel was commanded over and over to remember that their, Ab their father, Abraham, was a traveler. He was a sojourner, a pilgrim, who was, uh, received the hospitality of various people. Israel also had to remember that she was a stranger and received hospitality, at least initially, in Egypt as well. And so Israel was commanded, commanded in the law, to be hospitable to strangers in their midst, to care for them. In Exodus chapter 22, 23, Leviticus 19, over and over, they're told, be hospitable to the stranger in your midst. In the ancient world, uh, there were four phases to hospitality. When you came to a city, you came to a town, there was no Hampton Inn, there was no Holiday Inn, there was no... Uh, Radisson, no place like that to stay. And so what you would do is you would go to the city gate or you would go to the well or a public place and you would stand and just wait for somebody to recognize that you were a stranger. And if you encountered a stranger, you had an obligation to extend hospitality to them. And there were four stages. The first stage was uh, the welcome stage, the, the receiving stage. And in this stage, you investigated the person. You stood in the, the, uh, the open area, and then people, uh, someone would come along, and they would talk to you. It was considered a breach of honor to pass a stranger by. So they would talk to them. They would determine their intentions. They would ask why you're here. So you didn't just take anybody in. You talked to them a little bit, found out why they were there. They had business. You'd inspect their belongings, make sure they weren't carrying weapons. And then you would move to the provision stage. You would invite them into your home, and you would wash their feet, give them a meal. You would uh, extend to them the best that you could afford, the best food you had. Additional honor would be given to them by inviting the guest to speak, anointing his head with oil, giving him an honored place at the table. It was the duty of the host to provide protection from him from all harm. You honored your guest. You made him feel welcome. Uh, I remember reading about a, a, a young man. His father was a, a diplomat in uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, this was back in the, the 60s. And the young man and his father were out hunting in the desert, and they came across a Bedouin tribe. And the Bedouin tribe invited them to spend the night with them. And so they sat down with them and they gave them a place of honor. They treated them as honored guests. And as they were eating, the, uh, the head of the Bedouin tribe offered the son, a 12-year-old boy, offered him the choicest part of the meal, gave him a sheep's eyeball. <laughs> Imagine being a 12-year-old boy and he hands you a sheep's eyeball. And the little boy, of course, did what all 12-year-old boys do. He said, no. Uh-uh. <laughs> and his father leaned over to him, and he said, this is an honor. If you don't take it, you will insult him. He's extending you hospitality. The little boy said that he took that, he put it in his mouth, he chewed once and swallowed hard. <laughs> but you extended the very best that you had. You gave the best that you had to, to try and make them feel welcome. And finally, there was the, the departure stage. Now, guests traditionally in, in biblical times only stayed for no more than two nights. It was considered rude to stay more than two nights unless you were specifically asked to stay longer than that. Uh, even in ancient times, the old proverb held true, fish and house guests both stink after three days. So after three days, you had to move along. And... Uh, part of your, your hospitality was that you would make sure when they moved on, they were well provisioned, they were well supplied for their journey. So it was, it was traditional understanding within the ancient uh, society, the ancient cultures, to provide hospitality. Especially during the church age. During the church age, hospitality was expected as well. 
There was a huge need for hospitality in the church because, first of all, during the church age, much of the church was being persecuted and refugees were fleeing to the cities, especially to Rome. And when they got to the city, they needed someone who would care for them and provide for them and, and extend a welcome to them. They were hurting and hopeless and often uh, with nothing for themselves to provide for themselves. And so when they came into the cities, the church would provide for these Christian refugees who were continually pouring in. They would show hospitality to their persecuted brothers and sisters. There also was a need during the church age because Christian businessmen would travel throughout the Roman Empire. And although they had good roads and they had uh, uh, good uh, laws and good law enforcement in that day and time, what they didn't have, as I said, were, were inns, Hampton inns and, and hotels, that sort of thing. The few lodgings that you did have usually were houses of prostitution. They were uh, sketchy at best. They were run by people who were dishonorable. And you would not put a, a, a family member in a place like that. So when a Christian businessman came to town, you would put him up. You take care of him. You provide for his need. Christian businessmen were, were fellow believers, and so you provided hospitality for them. Also, hospitality was essential during the early church because it, it helped the spread of the gospel. Like Christian businessmen, preachers and missionaries had to have a place to stay. They had to have someone that would provide for them. In more than one place, Christians are exhorted throughout the scriptures here to open their homes, to welcome guests, especially those who are laboring for the gospel, preachers and missionaries. I think about John, who writes in his third epistle. He commends Gaius for showing hospitality to strangers who came preaching the gospel. He rebuked Diotrephes, who refused to welcome Christian workers, and in fact discouraged others from welcoming Christian workers as well in 3 John 9, uh, 9 and 10. When the Lord sent out the 72, he expected them to receive hospitality in Luke chapter 10. When the apostles and their fellow workers were commanded to take the gospel to remote places, the Lord anticipated that believers would extend hospitality to them, would care for them and provide for their needs. Of course, that doesn't mean that they were obligated to take in just anybody. The Bible places limitations on hospitality that was given to preachers and teachers. False teachers... False prophets were not to receive hospitality, he says. 2 John chapter 1, verse 10, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. In fact, he says that anyone who welcomed him shared in his wicked work. So we see the truth was not to be sacrificed in order to show hospitality to people. There were limits to our hospitality. The Bible contains wonderful examples of hospitality. Abraham and Lot showed hospitality to men in Genesis chapter 18 and 19 that eventually turned out to be angels. Think about that. What if you show hospitality to someone? Someone comes and visits, you make them feel welcome, you invite them to your Sunday school class, you take them to lunch with you, and you find out when you get to heaven that you entertained an angel that day. It's possible. It's possible. Rebecca opened her home to Abraham's servant in Genesis chapter 24. Job boasts in Job chapter 31, verse 32. Job is, is defending himself. He's saying, listen, I'm a righteous man. And one of the things he points out is that no stranger had to spend the night in the street, for my door was always open to the traveler. Hospitality. We know that Jesus was always a welcome guest with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Peter stayed in Joppa with the tanner named Simon. Peter also received an invitation to stay with Cornelius. Lydia, the, the dealer in purple cloth, invited the apostle Paul to stay at her house. After Paul and Silas converted the Philippian jailer, he took them into his house. He fed them and he treated their wounds. On his last trip to Jerusalem, Paul stayed several times along the way with Christians. He stayed with disciples in Tyre. He stayed with a, a brother named uh, at Ptolemaeus. He stayed in the home of Philip, the evangelist. He stayed with a man named Nason, in, uh, who was a disciple from Cyprus. So throughout the scripture, we see these examples of hospitality. And throughout history, the church has continued to show hospitality. One of the most moving examples of Christian hospitality in the 20th century took place in Europe in, in World War II. When 
The Christian church sheltered many Jews who were being persecuted by the Nazis. Many of you have read the book, The Hiding Place. Cory Ten Boom tells the story of her father who built a, a false wall, created a, a room, and they sheltered seven Jews in there for several months before they were finally discovered by the Germans. The scripture also tells us, and this is really interesting to me, if you are going to be a leader in the church, one of the requirements to be a leader in the church is that you are prone to hospitality. If you're going to be a bishop, a pastor, an elder, 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 3 lists a number of, of requirements. He says you should be above reproach, you should be a man of one wife, you should be temperate, self-controlled, you should be respectable, you should not be a drunkard, you should not uh, be, be consumed with a love for money. But right in the middle of all this is he's hospitable. Hospitable. Now, I have known a lot of, of pastors, people who disqualified as pastors. I've known people who were disqualified as deacons. Have you ever heard anybody say, well, you know, he's just not really qualified because he's just not very hospitable. Just never invites anybody over. He just never makes people feel welcome. But it is just as important a requirement as any of the others to extend hospitality. Furthermore, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 9, when it talks about taking care of widows, evidently there was a list of, of elderly widows that the church would care for. And it says that they were not to be added to this list unless they were well known for their good deeds, for bringing up children, washing the feet of the saints, helping those in trouble, and showing hospitality. It was that important. So hospitality, it is something that we see throughout the Old Testament. It's something that's a part of the history of the church. We see it repeated over and over in the New Testament. But we also see here in our scripture tonight, in verse 9, it is a duty of all Christians. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. We have a responsibility to show hospitality. While hospitality is, is uh, to be shown to strangers and guests, it's to be exercised by all people. All those who are believers in Christ have this obligation to make people feel at home. When they come to be a part of the church, the Bible says that we are to carry each other's burdens, Galatians 6.2. To do good to all people, especially those who are part of the family of believers in Galatians 6.9. He tells us in Romans 12, 13, that we have an obligation to practice hospitality. Hebrews 13 urges us to follow the example of the, the ancients who emphasized hospitality. And because of it, sometimes unknowingly, he says, welcomed angels into their homes. We all talk about that in Genesis chapter 18. Abraham and Lot entertained angels. Now, it's true that there's not as much need today for the hospitality for traveling Christian workers. Used to be in old days, some of you may remember this time, whenever a, an evangelist came to the church, the, the pastor would keep him in his home or someone would, would put him up in his home because you, you just didn't put him in hotels, you kept him in your home. Why did they do that? Well, part of it was financial reasons, but another part was because they recognized what the scripture said. You have a duty to hospitality, to extend hospitality to the Christian brother and sister who's traveling through your community. Hospitality is often required uh, in, in the scriptures. It's to be extended to anyone. It's just simple etiquette. Now, in the church today, how does this, how does this affect us? Where, where do we see this? We see it in a number of places. We see it when there are newcomers to our church. When people come to visit our church, do they feel welcome? Do they feel like we really are glad they're here? I know people will say they want us to be a friendly church. They want Eastside Baptist Church to be a friendly church. You know, some folks, I don't want us to be a friendly church. There, there are a lot of friendly churches out there. We have plenty. The word woods are full of friendly church. I want us to be a church of friends. There's a difference. A friendly church will greet somebody and say, Hey, glad to see you today. A church of friends wants to cultivate a relationship with that person. A church of friends wants to extend a welcome to them. Let them know, we really do want you to be here. We really do want you to be a part of, of our lives and our community. 
You know the problem with hospitality? You know why hospitality is so hard today? It's because it just takes such an investment of time and energy. It really does. It, 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 it's a drain to do it. But folks, the Bible says if we're believers in Christ, we're to be hospitable. We'll be hospitable. And another area in which I think this directly impacts us, and I think it's, it's uh, something that is unique to our day and time. We've heard a lot about the, the refugees in Syria and how there was a lot of debate about whether or not we should receive refugees into our country. And what, however you, you fall down on that, whether you're, you're for receiving refugees in the country or opposing refugees in the country, here's the thing. Once they are admitted to our community, we have an obligation to show Christian love, to show Christian love to them. Uh, I think South Carolina is uh, slated to receive something like 340 refugees, Syrian refugees. Folks, if they settle some in liberty, we have an obligation to show them Christ, to show them the love of Christ, to extend a welcome to them. Even when people are different than us, we need to make them feel loved. We need to extend a welcome to them. Hospitality is rare today. You don't see it very often within our communities because, uh, we, like I said, we don't even know our neighbors. Hospitality is uh, it's, it's rare because gated communities have popped up around uh, the country. It's considered rude today to drop in on people. People don't visit like they once did. You know, back in, in my grandparents' day, you would drop in on neighbors, you would go to see them, you would visit them, you'd invite them over to your house. That doesn't happen much anymore. We need to be a lot more hospitable. We need to develop a sense of community by showing hospitality to the people around us. Get to know your neighbors. I invite them into your home. And when there's a crisis in their life, then uh, you have an opportunity to minister to them. Get to know them. Show hospitality to them. I've noticed the trend over the years that many people, they no longer visit in each other's home. They, they no longer spend time with neighbors and people in the community. And this is a shame. We need to support and love one another. We need to practice hospitality. How different the picture in the Bible is. There, the home is always open to friends and neighbors. Uh, money is to be spent not on, on our own personal luxury, but on ministering to other people. And the result is hospitality. Of course, it can be a lot of work, as I've already said. But he says, do this without complaining. Do it without complaining. Peter says, be hospitable, hospitable to one another without grumbling about it. Think of what it says to complain about uh, showing hospitality. How, how loving is that? How Christian is that? It, some people complain about uh, the fact that the church gets together for, for dinners and eating meetings. You know, we make fun of the fact that Baptists eat together a lot. But folks, that's a Christian discipline. Yeah, we get together for a social, and we get together uh, for, for a meal, and we get together in, in fellowship. That's part of the function of the church. It's biblical. It's scriptural. To be hospitable. And think of what it says uh, to those who ref uh, about those who refuse to participate in hospitality, who refuse to, to extend Christian love to other people. Not being like Christ. I read about a family who was entertaining a pastor and uh, his wife... Uh, the the uh, pastor and his wife had come over, and uh, they were entertaining him. Had a couple of people from Sunday school had come over too. One of the deacons had come. So they got a big table full of people. They're all sitting around, and they're all eating. And dad looks over at his, his son, who's a little boy, and he says, Son, why don't you say grace for us? And the little boy says, Well, I don't know what to say. And mom looks over and says, Well, honey, just say what you've heard me say in the past. The little boy says, all right. Folds his hands. He says, Lord, why did I have all these people over? I swear I'll never do it again. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's the attitude that, that we have quite often. It's just so much work to show hospitality. 
But folks, it is essential. It is essential if we're going to build community, make people feel welcome, and develop connections with people over which the gospel travels. It can be difficult to show hospitality, but it is essential. In the scriptures, the, script, the Bible says that one day we'll all stand before the throne of God. And, and on that day, it says that the Lord will praise us for certain things. And it doesn't mention being praised for our knowledge of the Bible or being praised for some job or position that we held at the church. But it says a lot about hospitality. Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from, from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you, or thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of these, the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Imagine that. God will reward us for showing hospitality. It's the very mark of being a believer in Christ. Tonight, the, the invitation is just really simple. Just very simple. Who is it that you can show the love of Christ to by being hospitable? Who is it that you need to extend hospitality to? Is it a next door neighbor that you haven't met? Is it a, a person that perhaps is alone and has no one? Is it a, a newcomer to the church, somebody who hasn't developed a friend? You know, uh, statistics say that if a person visits a church and they don't have at least three relationships, three people with which they have connected, they're going to disappear. They're going to fall away. Is there somebody that the Holy Spirit is laying on your heart you need to show hospitality to? You need to show the love of Christ in a very real, physical manner by being hospitable towards that person. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask that right now you would lay upon our hearts one person, one individual, one family at least, that we need to show hospitality toward, that we need to show the love of Christ in a real concrete fashion. Lord, we ask that you would forgive us of the sin of being inhospitable. We live in a day when it is the norm in our culture. Lord, help us to be different. Help us to show the love of Christ, to love people in a, in a real, genuine, concrete fashion so that people will feel welcome and loved. In Jesus' name.